I may, um, yeah, I'm going to just be focused on sort of economic inequality, but aware at all times of the connections into those wider issues. And I expect that a lot of those um, wider points will be picked up in the Q&A, which I'm really looking forward to. Um, and I will try to stick to the time limit of sort of half an hour, 40 minutes that Jack gave me. Um, I remember once speaking to a, well, I won't name names, but a very a celebrators of international uh, academic who said, you know, Max, my, um, my stated policy is always to take questions if time allows. And my unstated policy is to make sure that time never does allow um, this, this, this person, definitely not as a Democrat in the fullest sense, but I am. So I'm looking forward to the Q&A. Um, in which case, with no further ado, I will get on with the presentation, um, which I hope you can all see. So um, this is a picture from, gosh, nearly a decade ago from when I spent three weeks living in a boarding house um, in order to report on it for the listener. Um, and it was every bit as grim as it looks. Uh, there were 14 people in it, very cold, moldy, damp, leaked when it rained, um, no real communal facilities. Um, and even a decade ago, it cost $150 a week. Um, so, you know, really quite exploitative, but catering to extremely poor people who would otherwise be living on the street. That was sort of one end of the spectrum. And then of course, at the other end of the spectrum in New Zealand, you have very lavish properties like this one at the time, uh, the most expensive house <laughs> built in New Zealand um, on Auckland's Paritai Drive, uh, <laughs> constructed for the now disgraced financier Mark Hotchin. Um, so that's a little, little taste of the two ends of the spectrum in New Zealand. And, and I bring that up partly because I often find that when I talk to people about economic inequality, I realized that what they actually hear is poverty. Um, and they're quite focused on one end of the spectrum. Now, of course, poverty is probably the thing that most is most troubling to us ethically, probably the thing that moves us most emotionally. It's what we often see as the problem, that there are people who, economically speaking, don't have enough. But of course, the point is that we live in a, in a wider system, and that system is characterized by inequality. So it's not just some people having too little, but arguably some people having too much. Um, and actually, you can't understand even the problems of poverty unless you understand the question of affluence. And indeed, wealth and poverty are intimately connected. So that's why I talk about inequality. Um, now, I suspect that in this audience, compared to most audiences, you'll be relatively familiar um, with the facts. And I certainly won't have to convince you that economic inequality exists um, and is real. But it's always good, I find, to just refresh one's memory. Um, and so I just wanted to quickly present to you a data, uh, some data about income inequality in New Zealand from the 80s, which is when it really starts to take off, and also when we have, from when we have good records through to 2016. And the picture hasn't changed significantly since then. Um, and it sort of looks at the incomes of four typical people in New Zealand. Um, as you can see on the right. And this is the income adjusted, uh, sorry, inflation adjusted disposable income. And, you know, what you see firstly is that incomes for the poorest tenth of New Zealanders haven't really increased to any significant extent um, in the last 30, 40 years. Um, and nor really have those of middle New Zealanders. Um, in contrast, incomes for people in the richest tenth of the country have doubled. And finally, incomes for people in the richest 1%. This is a slightly different data source. It's pre-tax income rather than post-tax income. So it's not strictly comparable, but just to give you a bit of a flavor uh, for what's going on uh, in New Zealand, uh, that is what's happened to the pre-tax incomes of the richest 1%. And the, the wider point here is really clear, you know, just in the last 30 to 40 years, we've built an economic system, which is profoundly unequal, which delivers the bulk of its rewards to those who are already doing well, and doesn't do much to improve the material living standards of um, a vast swathe of New Zealanders. Um, now, of course, you know, within that wider story, 
there are differential impacts. And on a point I'll come back to later, well, and picking up the point I just made, actually, you know, that top line, huge increases for the richest 1%, is not disconnected to the bottom line, the stagnation of the poorest 10%, as we will see those things are intimately connected. Um, now, obviously, I'm talking about economic inequality, but there's lots of different kinds of inequality, and they all intersect, um, as is the, the term these days, they overlap. Um, and this is just, you know, a little reminder that of, of how those intersections sometimes operate. This is from census data, and it's looking at um, incomes for women as a proportion of male income, income for Māori as a proportion of Pākehā income. And what you see is that you know, in the post-war period, from 50 through to the sort of mid-80s, there were gains in income being made for both those groups. But then with the big shift to a more unequal um, economic system, that progress either plateaued or went into reverse. And, you know, often that, in, you know in part, that's because, um, well, for women, that's things like the benefit cuts and sort of the you know, tax on sold parents. Um, for Māori, that's the mass unemployment created through the sell-off of um, state assets and the removal of tariffs, you know, that really decimated sort of the low, relatively low skilled industries in which Māori often found themselves. Um, and that's part of a wider international picture. Um, I'm not going to dwell on this graph for too long, but it's the share of income going to the richest 1% in the English speaking countries. Um, and, you know, without trying to follow the individual lines too closely, very clear picture of declining inequality, declining share for the rich 1% through the post-war period, and then a really abrupt increase again in the sort of Reagan, Thatcher and Roger Nomics era, um, which in some countries has put the share of 1% back to its sort of um, jazz age 1920s levels. Anyway, whipping through all of this pretty briefly because um, there's probably other questions that people want to get onto. Um, and I'm happy to come back on anything in the questions. So that was, in, that was inequality of income. Um, of course, the other major way in which, um, you know, economic resources are held is wealth, in the sense of what people own rather than what they earn. Um, and, you know, while income is unevenly distributed in the sense of the richest 1% have about 10% of it, uh, wealth is twice as unequally distributed. Um, this is an image that I worked on with the extremely talented illustrator Toby Morris, uh, who many of you will know from his COVID-19 visualizations. Um, and it's imagining all the wealth in New Zealand uh, as if it were a 10-story tower, um, so divided into tenths. It's a bit of a metaphor for thinking about how, much, how yeah, unequal is wealth. And what you see is that the richest, the wealthiest 1% of New Zealanders, so that's really just about 40,000 adults, um, have a fifth of all the wealth. Um, so they would have the top two stories of this notional building all to themselves, even though there are a tiny number of people. Um, conversely, the poorest half of the country, so that's getting on for 2 million adults, um, have just 2% of all the wealth in the country. So they would be crammed into half the basement. Um, so really profound inequalities of wealth there. And that's really important because both, both kinds of inequalities matter. You know, income is what people use to sort of get through the day to day and week to week. So income inequality profoundly affects people's lives as they're sort of led day to day in terms of paying bills. Um, wealth is sort of, is more what people use as a, you know, as a reserve, as a sort of hedge against the future, as something to draw on in tough times. It provides security and stability. So un, an imbalance there, you know, leads to profoundly different lives people can lead in terms of sort of stability and security and ability to plan for the future um, that they enjoy. Now, in terms of what has got us um, to this state, there's a huge range of factors. And like I said, at this point, you always have there's always trickiness in terms of what is inside and what is outside of scope. Um, at this point, I mean, you could go infinitely large in terms of what causes economic inequality. Um, to keep things tractable, I don't go too wide, but you know, you do have to acknowledge that some things sort of aren't even in the frame to begin with. 
because you know when I'm talking about income and wealth, of course, I'm talking about things that are valued as economic resources, things on which a price is put, which can be traded in markets, loosely speaking. And of course, just the selection of that frame initially excludes a huge range of things. So, you know, and this will be familiar to a lot of people, but obviously unpaid labor, classically the work of, say, looking after children or caring for elderly relatives, classically carried out um, disproportionately by women, is, of course, not counted in any of these statistics, not rewarded um, because it isn't traded in markets. Ditto a lot of people's wider social contributions, the volunteering, the community work that they do, which is incredibly valuable, doesn't come into this picture. Um, also things like Ropatu, the, wide, the confiscation of Māori land throughout the 19th and 20th centuries, uh, which has led to only about 5% of um, land remaining in Māori hands. Um, that's you know, obviously a, a huge wrong in sort of moral and social terms, but also has massive economic consequences in terms of inequality and the deprivation um, of an asset base from which Māori might have grown their wealth. So there's all these much wider factors um, that are affecting the discussion. If you sort of narrow it down a little bit more, um, of course, you know, we're talking about the economy, the, the paid economy. So a lot of where in places where inequality is created is in the workplace very often. Um, and in the last 30, 40 years, a big driver of that unequal economy that I showed you at the outset um, is the imbalance in power in the workplace. Um, over the last 30, 40 years, we've seen things like the Employment Contracts Act, which made it very hard for unions to organize. We've seen union, union membership fall from about 70% of the workforce to under 20% today. Um, and as a result of that sort of weakened bargaining power for workers, as against sort of the increased power of corporations to you know, to lobby for changes that they like, to move overseas or to threaten to move overseas if they don't like um, the laws that governments propose to pass. We've seen the, the share of company revenue that goes to employees, that goes to workers, fall from 58% to 48%. And obviously that difference um, is made up by ex all that extra revenue going to the owners of companies instead. Um, that equates to the average wage being about $12,000 a year lower than it would be if employees had retained their share of corporate revenue. Um, and of course, those inequalities of wages most affect um, women, ethnic minorities, other people in low paid work. So there's a huge, much greater increase in inequality as handed out in the workplace. Then when government swings into action with the things that people normally think of as you know, the means by which you tackle inequality with things like tax and welfare. Of course, the story there is that government does much less to reduce economic imbalances than it used to. So the top tax rate used to be 66%. Um, in the 80s, it was halved to 33%. Uh, GST was introduced, which has a flat rate tax, takes the biggest chunk out of the incomes of the poorest. Benefits were cut in 1991 by about a quarter of their value by Ruth Richardson. Um, working for families has been introduced in the last uh, 15 years and that reduces inequality a little bit but not that much and of course um, you know in the 80s and 90s we're sowing the seeds of a housing crisis as you know government stopped sort of shaping and properly um, regulating the housing market as we develop leaky homes as we stop building state houses in any meaningful um, quantity and we stopped allowing cities to either build up or out, um, thus leading to a massive undersupply of housing. And we sort of, and we built a kind of speculative market around housing with huge amounts of bank lending flowing into it. Um, yeah, an enormous sort of liquidity in that area. So even though the government is now faced with much greater inequalities as created in the workplace, and I should have added that even amongst wage earners, there's a huge divide now between CEOs who get paid vastly more than they used to and people in many uh, industries like retail whose pay rates are actually lower probably than they were 30 years ago once you account for inflation. Um, so there's much bigger inequalities in the workplace, but government is doing less to reduce them with taxes and benefits 
than it used to. Um, finally, of course, you just sort of got various economic effects around the power of wealth. You know, if you have wealth, it, you can just passively accumulate it by investing it. And um, the work of Thomas Piketty uh, to try to boil down 1200 pages of, of economic theory briefly is that if you've already got wealth and you invest it passively, it will grow more quickly than people can grow their fortunes by working in the current economy. So there's a natural tendency within capitalism for inequality to increase to a very, very high point. We have huge amounts of inherited wealth, huge amounts of wealth owned by the top 1% and a profoundly uh, unequal economy. So that resembles that of the Victorian era. And of course, all these things exacerbate and spiral. You know, once you have wealth, it's easier to maintain it and grow it. Conversely, if you fall into poverty, there's all these poverty traps in terms of debt, predatory lending, um, precarious work, insufficient benefits, lack of childcare, um, discrimination, and all those kinds of effects. So there's lots of forces that, that kind of that tend to push towards greater inequality. Um, in terms of the consequences of that in economic inequality, I normally spend a lot of time on that in talks, but I'm going to take quite a lot of that as read. Um, I'll just make a couple of points on that. Just to remind, this is a graph that will be familiar to a number of people. It's from the spirit level. Um, it's an index of health and social problems. So things like homicide rates, teenage pregnancy rates, um, low educational achievement, um, a variety of measures like that. And it just graphs it against income inequality. And unsurprisingly, you see a connection in the sense that the more unequal your society, the greater your level of these health and social problems. And, you know, and the causal mechanisms aren't very hard to understand. You know, in unequal societies, people lose their sort of sense of empathy and trust in each other because they live such profoundly different lives in material terms. Um, so yeah, so trust declines, community cohesion declines, society becomes more materially competitive, which of course has implications for the environment, greater emphasis on keeping up with the Joneses materially, it's more stressful, it's more competitive, uh, there's lots of people who are very poor and so they feel, you know, they experience a lot of despair, a sense of sort of hopelessness about their lives, and that drives a huge range of health and social problems. Um, and America, of course, is the poster child for massive inequality within the developed world, has exactly the levels of health and social problems you'd expect. We, as a now relatively unequal country, although not the worst, have the level of health and social problems you'd expect. Um, and of course, driven thing by things like our terrible suicide rates um, and other social problems. The other point I just wanted to make briefly is that, you know, sometimes people say, well, I mean, you hear this less, but sometimes people say, well, it isn't sort of inequality of outcomes that matters, inequality of income and wealth, it's the inequality of opportunity that matters. That's a classic sort of conservative trope. And, and the very simple problem with that argument is you actually can't separate the two. Um, if you have very profound differences between rich and poor, rich and poor kids are going to start out with very different opportunities in life, um, and that continues throughout their adulthood. So unsurprisingly, in Denmark, less than one fifth of your adult can be predicted from what your parents earned. So there's not much transmission of advantage and disadvantage, and there's quite equal opportunities. In the US, that figure is one half. So effectively, half of your economic success as an adult is predetermined. Um, you know, and the best choice in life you can make, as the joke goes, is to choose the right parents. Um, in New Zealand, again, we're probably somewhere in the middle. So about a third of your income is, is predetermined, which is a profoundly unfair. Um, situation to live in. So that, that's a whistle stop to us through some of the causes and consequences of inequality. Um, but I figured, and, and Jack's confirmed this for me, that you'd want to spend a bit of time thinking about the solutions and the, the positive side of things. So I'm going to spend a bit of time at the end here talking about that. This, um, and apologies for the very rudimentary graphic design here, but this is just the first graph that I showed you flipped on its head basically. And it sort of says, well, if the story of the last 30 or so years has been one of massively increased inequality, what might we think about for the next 30 or so years? Um, and yeah, so what I've done here is just crudely flip the graph. That's why it's called flipping the future. And so instead of 
living in a world where incomes for the richest New Zealanders have doubled and for the poorest they have stagnated, could we imagine a world in which incomes for the poorest New Zealanders double and incomes for the richest New Zealanders are the ones that stagnate? And obviously that has, um, that I hadn't thought about this until now, but that obviously ties in, I guess, to ideas about the economy of enough and, and sufficiency and being content with what you already have if you're doing well. Um, and sort of the, and part of the reason I find this appealing is that that would, at the moment, sort of in New Zealand, people in the richest tent earn about roughly 10 times as much as people in the poorest tent. Um, back in the 80s, that ratio was about five to one. A ratio of five to one is also, roughly speaking, the ratio enjoyed by the most equal societies today, um, the likes of Denmark. Um, and so for me, that represents a goal which is both consistent with New Zealand history and with what sort of the modern, you know, the, the realities of the global economy suggest is, is achievable. So I think that could be something to aim for. Being realistic that achieving that, even though that would be a long, you know, and that might be a level of inequality that people still regard as, ex as excessive, uh, but even achieving that would be, you know, a pretty Herculean effort, frankly. Um, and you can sort of see that when you start to think a bit about um, Jacinda Ardern's record to date. So I'm a, I'm generally sort of an optimist and my approach to things mostly is yes and. Um, so in terms of the good things that uh, Ardern's government has done so far, um, probably the biggest sort of statement they've made about inequality has been to set very demanding targets for reducing child poverty. Um, of course, child poverty is family poverty, but you know, child poverty is a good lens. Um, the targets are very ambitious. You know, Ardern wants to reduce the number of people who are well, children living in families that have got less than half the average income from the 16% she inherited, so that's about one in six, to just 5%. Um, by 27, 28, so taking it down to just one in 20, which would be a huge reduction. Um, that would put us among the best performers in the developed world, up there with the likes of Denmark. Um, so, you know, great, they've got ambitious targets, but they've only made pretty incremental progress so far. That 16% figure before COVID, they'd got down to about 13 point something percent. Um, and there's going to be, need to be a lot more work done to achieve that. Um, but, you know, they have been making real increases to the incomes of the poorest New Zealanders. Uh, there's about 100,000 families who are on average $175 a week better off because of the changes that Labour has introduced. A lot of that was the $5 billion families package. So big increases to working for families payments, uh, the introduction of the best start payment for the youngest children, uh, creation of the winter energy payment and things like that. Uh, there have also been increases to core benefits such that the basic unemployment benefit is now nearly $90 higher than it was when Ardern took office, um, which is significant and various other measures. Obviously some you know, decent sized increases to benefits in the budget big play made of having unwound Ruth Richardson's 1991 cuts, um, certainly in sort of absolute dollar terms. And those changes are forecast to lift another sort of 10 to 30,000 children out of poverty, um, depending on the measure. So, you know, that's all positive. Um, and things like fair pay agreements, uh, which are on the way, could significantly lift the wages of some of the worst paid workers is also been an increase in the minimum wage to $20 an hour. However, I would say that uh, they, on the and side of things, and there needs to be an awful lot more done. Um, you know, in terms of tackling poverty, there's going to be problems of dealing with the ongoing impacts of COVID, which felt profoundly unequally. Um, the sort of the increasing depth of poverty that some families are in, the fact that, you know, the, the deeper the poverty that families are in, the more it costs to lift them up and out of poverty. And 
you know, the government hasn't been particularly keen on raising significant um, amounts of revenue. Uh, and there are problems with abatement clawbacks. So you increase benefits and people lose their entitlement to other forms of support um, and so on and so forth. There's an awful lot more to unwind um, just narrowly on tackling poverty, but of course, more generally in the economy. Um, benefits have been so low for such a long time that they've fallen miles behind wages. Um, and a lot more is need, needed to be done to restore the living standards of beneficiaries. Um, and of course, as I said at the outset, you know, poverty is only half of the story. The other half is about wealth and excessive wealth. And the government has been extremely uh, unwilling to act in that area. Of course, there was the back down on the capital gains tax, um, which we don't need to go over, but was very significant. More generally, there's been a real lack of enthusiasm for actually ensuring that the wealthiest New Zealanders even pay a fair share of tax. Um, as some of you may have seen, it was revealed earlier this year, and I think this is one of the absolute most striking facts about New Zealand, is that when you look at the wealthiest New Zealanders, and these are people with over $50 million, um, nearly half of them are paying less than 10% of their income in tax. So they're paying a lower rate of tax than someone on an absolute bare sort of minimum wage job. And a lot of cases that's because they take their income as capital gains and the government has decided not to tax that. Um, but there's a host of other measures that wealthy people use to, uh, to evade taxation. Um, and of course, the, the last election, the Green Party proposed a straight wealth tax, um, which would have raised, could raise about something like $8 billion a year, even at quite a low rate. And these are the kinds of things that the government has very explicitly decided not to deal with. Um, so in terms of that sort of flipping the future graph that I showed, there wouldn't be a huge long way um, towards achieving that. Um, what, what might they do that might get them closer to that? Um, I'm sure there'll be a lot of interest and discussion on this. You know, inequality, like I said, is so vast. There's an infinitely long list of things, you know, that I could put up. These are, these are just a few policy ideas looking at economic inequality quite narrowly, um, I think would make a difference. Um, firstly, although some people are very concerned about automation and so on and so forth, I think the big challenge in the short term is not mass unemployment, but mass redeployment. You know, people who have been put out of work, there will be new jobs for them to fill, but they won't have the skills for them. So we need to invest hugely in retraining programs for the unemployed. Um, I'd also like to see the widespread adoption of the living wage. I'm sure many of you will be familiar with this. You know, it's a voluntary rate at $22.60, I think, um, as opposed to the minimum wage of $20. You know, so just basically trying to push up wages across the country through campaigning. It's voluntary, but I'd like to see the government create more incentives or more, you know, more nudges for uh, firms to pick it up widely. Um, again, on the welfare front, um, a lot of talk in some circles about a universal basic income, which I'm not a fan of because, uh, you know, the reality is that you, because it's universal, you have to pay it to everyone. And so you can't afford to pay it at anything higher than the current unemployment benefit, which is massively insufficient. I'm much more in favor of a guaranteed minimum income, which would be a really generous core benefit, probably set at the rate of New Zealand super. So, you know, um, thousands of dollars a year higher than it is now and available without any tests. So removing a lot of the, of the stigmatizing um, hoops people have to jump through and the questions about their relationship status and the compulsory sort of work efforts, um, but which would be slowly clawed back from people as they earn more in paid work, um, which is what enables it to be affordable and means you can pay it really generously to people who need it. And I like the idea, as I said, you know, guaranteed minimum income, there is a standard of living that society guarantees you will not fall below. Um, on the housing front, huge amount of work needed, um, too many things to list. I think we really need to keep the push on, though, particularly on state housing. The government's building 2,000 state homes a year, which is great. Um, but on a population adjusted basis, 
the first Labour government was probably building tens of thousands of homes, the equivalent of tens of thousands of homes a year. So we need to step that up. And I'd like to see that building done in really environmentally friendly ways. So that probably means, you know, off-site manufacture, prefabrication, those kinds of things, reduce wastage, improve efficiency. And of course, make sure that the houses are built to a really, really exacting, um, really exacting environmental standards. Lastly, obviously, taxing wealth. I've kind of already touched on that. You know, I think we need this just as a basic principle of fairness. We also need um, revenue to fund all these other things that we need to do. Um, like I said, a straight wealth tax, 1% of wealth over a million dollars, which was the Green Party proposal, would raise, you know, something in the region of $8 billion a year. There are other, there's other things you could do. You could have a capital gains tax and an inheritance tax combined. Um, you could have a land tax, although I'm less enthusiastic about that. You could have a property tax. I'm not sort of particularly partisan about how we do this, just as long as we do something to ensure that people at the upper end who aren't paying a lot of tax actually contribute their fair share. So yeah, I'm sure there'll be lots of debate about those things. Just wanted to finish on a little note about inequality and climate, since you know I know that's your point of interest. This climate change absolutely isn't my specialist subject, um, but I thought it's just worth reflecting that obviously there's lots of connections between these two subjects. Um, they're linked in terms of responsibility, in the sense that you know, as you probably know, a small number of nations um, worldwide are responsible for a huge share of the global climate uh, carbon emissions to date. They're linked in time in the sense that the, the great period of reducing inequality from the 50s to the 80s was done by really turbocharging economic growth for working people while keeping a lid on the returns on inherited wealth. But of course, that was also the period when we really started to trash the planet. Um, these things are linked in causality in the sense that even within countries, it's the wealthiest people who have the greatest carbon emissions. Also, I've seen some evidence that more egalitarian countries have lower emissions, probably partly because they have fewer poor people. So fewer people who feel totally disengaged from the system and think, well, why should I worry about things like climate change? Also, they're just more collaborative by nature. They're better at looking after the commons, uh, which of course is central to climate change. Um, actually, I didn't put it down, but I should have their link LinkedIn impacts, of course, in the sense that climate change will have the greatest impacts on some of the poorest countries um, in the world. And indeed the adaptation to climate change will be very costly even for poorer populations within developed countries. Um, and they're linked in terms of the solutions because you know, the classic conservative answer to concerns about economic inequality is, well, we just need to grow the pie. You know, we just need to increase economic growth and there'll be more for everyone. Now, I mean, not only does that not work because that's the trickle down approach that we tried in the 80s and it just means that the rich get richer. Um, but of course, you know, it, it seems pretty obvious that in the future we won't be able to rely on former levels of economic growth to get us out of the predicament because that may be simply incompatible <laughs> with preserving the planet. Um, you know, now I'm sort of agnostic on that question. I think that obviously the most important thing is we set environmental bottom lines. We tackle climate change, we protect the planet. You know, whatever growth, economic growth we can get beyond that is great. And that needs to go disproportionately to the people who still have, you know, substandard material living, uh, standard living. So that's people in developing countries, it's the poorer people in developed countries. Um, but, you know, there may not be that much growth to go around and it will have to be directed towards those populations. And the rest of us, you know, maybe have to be more content with enough, you know, to, to come back to the title of the work you're doing here, more content with the level of affluence that we do have. Um, and of course, that ties neatly into a small promo uh, for my own work. Um, very, very relevant to the, the, the uh, thesis of enough, because the book I've got coming out in November is called Too Much Money. And it's about going back on wealth disparities, but actually also talking about class you know, in the supposedly classless New Zealand, um, talking about all these interconnected issues and the fact that we do just have excessive wealth in many senses. And of course, that ties right back into the issues that you're interested in. So I'll close on that note. I hope that's been informative and at times um, 
well, inspiring might be too much, but at least positive um, in terms of some of the solutions. And I very much look forward to your questions. Kia ora. Well, that's great. Max, thank you very much for that terrific overview of the situation and uh, throwing out a range of suggestions about what, what can be done and what needs to be done. Um, just in terms of uh, process from here on, um, thank you for staying muted uh, during Max's presentation. What I would like you to do in terms of questions is to put your questions into the chat box at the lower portion of the screen. And I'm sure we'll get some multiple questions and so on. So I'd like to be able to choose the questions. And at that point, I will unmute you so that you can actually have an interaction with uh, Max and we can all hear the, the benefits of that dialogue. And while that's happening, while you're entering some of your questions, I'll start the process off by asking a couple of questions of Max. One of the things we know, uh, one of the consequences of inequality is reduced trust within society. Uh, one of the many social problems that it's associated with. At the same time, it seems that we need more trust to solve the issue of inequality. Um, and there's that issue, if you could address that, how do, how do we get ourselves out of that, that dilemma? There's also the issue that, that you've alluded to in terms of the many benefits of reduced inequality. There's many social and economic benefits of reduced inequality. How do we get that message across? You know, people feel that if their taxes are going to go up or if they have to distribute more of their wealth, they're going to be less well off. You know, what's the data? What's the evidence that thing that will all actually be better off if we have a more equal society? And, and can you speak to any of the financial impacts of, of that? Would, would we be actually be better off financially, even though we may be spending more on guaranteed income, if we're spending less on health and social problems and crime and all the other issues associated with inequality. Cool, all right. Well, um, yeah, two fantastic questions to kick off. Um, on trust, yeah, I think you, you're absolutely right. I mean, and trust is profoundly important for societies to operate well, and I think it's often underappreciated. Um, and, you know, the sort of Robert Putnam's work on social capital to, shows you that moving from a sort of a high trust, high social uh, capital network to one that's low in those things can be as bad for your health as taking up smoking. You know, the re very, very powerful background effects of living in a trusting society versus living in a non-trusting one. The problem, of course, is that, you know, trust is, is very hard to win and very easy to lose. Um, and it, you can't sort of very easily engineer it. I mean, there's lots of different forms of trust. There's trust in government. You know, and trust in government is reasonably high in New Zealand, partly, I think, because we've had good leadership, you know, through COVID. Um, but I think we could have much more open government, you know, much greater transparency about what government's doing, much more opportunities for people to participate in government, you know, and this touches on some of my other work. Um, you know, other countries have actually got ahead of us in terms of things like citizens assemblies, climate assemblies, sort of community led budgeting, crowdsourced legislation things which sort of open up the workings of government and enhance trust from citizens. Um, but of course, the big thing with inequality is that it damages interpersonal trust, people's trust in other people. Um, and, that, and that's really hard. I don't know if you can sort of really engineer trust directly. I think you have to attack the problem at source, which is just by attacking economic inequality. I mean, I think we could also try to create more forums in which people from different walks of life encounter each other, which of course is crucial for democracy among other things. Um, you know, to the extent that we can encourage residential mixing rather than sort of rich and poor living in very different suburbs, I think that's positive, although that can be very hard to achieve. Um, you know, I mean, I would support sort of, I don't know, like paid sort of gap year volunteering programs you know, for people after school to go and work in, like within New Zealand, but in communities that are really different to theirs, you know, things to sort of restore that sense of other people's lives. 
Um, but it's a hard one, trust. Um, on your point about the benefits of reduced inequality, I mean, look, there's, there's, there's an infinite number of sort of stats and things you can point to, but I'm not, for people who aren't already listening to this argument, I, I don't know how compelling those stats are. What I do think is compelling is, is a positive vision um, about the future. And it's a vision that helps people make sense of the tax that they pay. And so one of the things, you know, and when you sort of look at this, the, when you do polling around people, you know, people have very little understanding actually of how tax works. Um, and often this will seem crazy, but people don't even always make the connection between the tax they pay and the services that they receive. If we're switched on political people, that may seem elementary, but it's really not. And so increasingly people are sort of trying to talk about tax and ways that emphasize those connections that emphasize sort of a cycle of, of giving and receiving. And it's sort of what you might call an intertemporal exchange. So, you know, the world we live in right now is one that was built for us by past generations through their tax contributions. You know, we are, we're living with the roads that past taxpayers paid to build, with a health system that they built, with an education system that they built. And that applies to the individual in the present day. You know, if you've made money in New Zealand, I think the argument has to be, and this is one that, something that Elizabeth Warren articulates really well in the States, you know, yes, you've worked hard, but you've made money by driving on roads that everyone paid for, by using ultra-fast broadband that everyone funded, by using a court system to enforce contracts and you know, maintain the law, that is a core part of what government does. So there's this common pool of resources, you know, built up by previous generations, we have to put back into that pool. If those things are going to continue to be there, those common resources to nurture us and to nurture future generations. So I think we need to talk about tax in much more positive ways that draw on those metaphors about exchange, about reciprocity, about the common pool of resources. And I think we have to have a positive vision for what life would look like if people paid more in tax. Because again, and that's the same argument made in a different way. It's about saying, yes, you'll pay more in tax, but look what you'll get. You'll get a world where every school is a good school. So you don't have to fret about, oh, can we afford to buy a, a house in the grammar zone? You know, you'll get a, a world where, I mean, if we paid enough in tax, we could have what the UK has, which is a free health system. You know, so you never need to worry about, can you afford to go to the doctor? We'll have a world in which there's a guaranteed minimum income or social insurance. So that if you suddenly lose your job, even as a well-paid person, there'll be a much more generous welfare system there to cushion the fall, to help you sort of stay on your feet, keep your life together, and then, you know, get back up and running again. You know, I think we have to make a positive argument about these things because that's what people... People who aren't listening yet, they won't, I don't think they'll find a whole lot more stats compelling. I think they will find that positive vision compelling. Okay, great, thank you, Max. Okay, we'll turn to some of the questions from participants. Um, Catherine uh, has a, um, a question here. Catherine, would you like to put your, your question directly to Max? You can unmute yourself and, and do that. Kia ora everyone. Sorry, I've got some background noise, so I'm, I'm happy for anyone just to read out my question and uh, discuss it. Thank you. Okay, I'll see if I can do that. Um, if we all have the ideas queued up already, is it a problem of mobilizing civic force to demand the transformation required? And would exposing these root causes of dysfunction in schools and, and reducing the voting age to 16 help? Mm. Yeah, really good question. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, sometimes sort of people launch research projects and things, and there are things that we don't know enough about in New Zealand, but by and large, I think we have a lot of the data we need. And we often, we know what a lot of the solutions are as well. Um, or at least the, the high level ones. Um, you know, I mean, I'm a big fan of, you know, devolution of sort of a lot of social services to, to Māori for Māori, for instance, because, you know, I don't know what the solutions there are, are there, but they will. Um, but yeah, broadly speaking, I think, 
you know we know what all of the a lot of the answers are and, and it is a communications problem rather than a than a data or a policy problem and you know and i think it's really, and there is quite a communications issue and it's multifaceted and even just to explain all the polling on inequality would take a long time but as simply as i can one part of that communications challenge has absolutely been done in the sense that the vast majority of New Zealanders, you know, 80% or so say they think, you know, that there's a lot of inequality about and they think it's a bad thing. You know, so you don't really have to convince New Zealanders of that anymore. And that's good because that wasn't the case a decade ago. The issue though is that that concern about inequality isn't translating into strongly into action to tackle it. And there's multiple reasons for that. One is partly that the word inequality actually doesn't work for a lot of people. You say inequality and they think, well, but we are all unequal. I mean, everyone's got different abilities. Do you want everyone to be exactly the same? And so it actually starts off a really unhelpful conversation or they think that you want incomes and wealth to be perfectly equal. And that's also a really unhelpful conversation to have. So the word doesn't always do it for people um, and actually you know, off, I mean, what you really need to be talking about is not reducing economic inequality. I mean, if I'm, if I'm talking to a wider audience, it's about reducing, about creating a world where everyone has the genuine opportunity to be well, to have well-being, to achieve their goals, and ensuring that they have the income and wealth that's there to support them. Um, you've also got a problem in the sense that when a, people in middle New Zealand say that there's too much inequality, what they mean is there's too much inequality and I'm the victim of it. Because in their minds, there's a lot of wealthy people who get away with not paying much tax and that's true, but they also think that there's huge amounts of support for poor people that they as middle earners don't get, which is not really true, but it's what people believe. And so it's quite hard for Ardern and Co to address inequality because they have to be very sensitive to middle New Zealand's feeling that addressing inequality means taxing them more to help the people beneath them on the ladder, which is, to be blunt, the last thing that a lot of those middle income voters want. So again, it's about having that positive vision that makes clear that reducing inequality is good for, you know, at least 80, 90% of the population, you know, 10% of people may actually you know, lose significant sort of privileges and wealth, but, you know, they are not determinant in the voting states. Without going on for too long, the, the third and last thing I'd mention in terms of the problems of getting things across to people is that people have profoundly lost their confidence in collective action to address these big problems. So Peter Skilling at AUT did a whole bunch of focus groups a few years ago on inequality and they found, you know, people hate inequality, but they just don't think anything can be done about it. You know, they've got pretty woolly ideas about how it might be solved. And it only takes one person in the focus group who's a bit of a market realist in quotes to stand up and say, well, look, this is all very well, but you can't change the market. You know, what people earn is determined by the market. And look, you just can't change it. And literally everyone else backs down and shuts up. Like it's really depressing. And that is, and in a lot of, you know, and people, a lot of people are really lukewarm about government action to address inequality, even though they think inequality is bad because, you know, they've been taught to think that that governments are ineffective and they waste your money and they don't spend taxes um, efficiently. So, you know, we've kind of broken sort of one myth of the 80s that inequality is fine and good and you shouldn't be worried about it, but we haven't really broken the other one, which is that the market is sort of, you know, there is no alternative and markets reign supreme. And so that's, you know, so why I wrote my book in 2018, Government for the Public Good, which is all about, well, actually, no, governments work much better than you think they do and markets work much worse. And this is what really good government could look like in the future. So I think that's a bit of the story that we have to focus on more um, yet in the coming years. Great, thank you. Max. Oh, and Jack, just, just before you go on, I just spotted a question in the chat. The Wealth Inequality Tower, you can just Google Wealth Inequality Tower um, New Zealand and it'll pop it up. It's by Toby Morris, it's on the spinoff. So yeah, it's a fa absolutely fabulous visualization. Yeah, yeah, great. No, it's a, it's a terrific graphic. Um, Marcus, you had a question here. Would you like to put it directly, uh, unmute yourself and put it directly mm -hmm. to Max? Yeah, thanks, Jake. Um, 
Yeah, a couple of things you were saying that were just really, really ringing bells with me. Um, so, um, like, for example, you, you just said three seconds ago that you think people are concerned that addressing inequality means uh, them, them getting text, text more. Um, and I actually just wrote a, le a letter to the um, editor of the Dominion Post, which they actually published, which was nice, um, appeared on in the Dom Post on Monday, um, saying... X response to um, Labour rolling out their initiatives uh, addressing um, equality, like the extra money for people on the dole and stuff, um, was that you'll be taxed more. And I, I said how that's actually a non sequitur. You know, all different political parties have got their own idea about how the, the pie should be spent. Um, and this, these initiatives are not, not about um, changing um, what you go put into the pie. These initiatives are about how you take money out of the pie. And of course, their um, priorities about taking stuff out of the pie, you know, say to address inequality and poverty, are going to be different from X <laughs> ways of taking stuff out of the pie. Um, so, you know, tr trying to legitimize their. Um, you know their point of view by saying it's just the working man that's going to suffer is is actually it's a, it, as I say it's a non sequitur makes no sense but anyway the the question I put in, put in the thingy um, was that people say that you need to put the most effort into areas that will give you the most benefit so I've been thinking how to address inequality and I'm thinking is there one particular thing that we can do that will give us the most benefit so which we can put our most effort into I mean ideally. I would like to change the entire global economic system because I think that would give us the most benefit, but it's also the hardest thing to do. Mm -hmm. um, not that people aren't making an effort, like Christian Felber and his economy for the kind of good, but you know, if you do a slightly more, you know, step down from that, maybe housing. You know, would, you know, if we really got social housing right, um, you know, built the housing right, you know, it's tr creating. Um, getting good uh, job uh, career opportunities for builders and whatnot and people get to learn about doing it and you know having a good career and they're really attention to detail and they're looking after the environment because they're doing it the right way um, and even just the, the way they're building up this the social housing uh, creates a little community where people can feel connected to each other you know that could be hugely positive but that's just one idea about what might give us the most benefit, but yeah, maybe maybe sure. there's something else. Well, look, look. I mean, I think it's it's really hard because there sort of isn't there isn't really a single one thing. But I guess if I really had to narrow it down, we. I mean, it's interesting. Housing at the moment is is obviously front and center of people's minds because the housing crisis is so appalling and you know and and housing is a good way to think and talk about inequality at the moment. It actually isn't, I mean, but there's a ton of other drivers. I sort of almost might sound, I don't want to sound crazy. I almost worry that, I, I think we need huge focus on housing at the moment, but I wouldn't want people to lose sight of the bigger picture because there's tons of causes of inequality mm -hmm. like, like I sketched out. Yep. Um, but, but absolutely, yeah, I mean, really sustained action on making housing equitable is really important. I think you're right to focus on state housing. Obviously, I touched on that. I also think the state's role in, in sort of guiding development, um, you know, and so in particular ensuring that housing, you know, meets environmental goals, you know, I think we need a much more active state in the way that we used to have a bit more of in the past that, you know, really determines that new housing happens along public transport corridors, for instance. You know, there's a bit of that that goes on, but not nearly enough. Here in Wellington, you know, I would love the state to use its compulsory purchase powers to perch up, per, uh, to buy up a whole swathe of, frankly, very poorly used land on Adelaide Road and Johnsonville along the transport spine, just compulsory purchase it, have a really beautiful environmentally sustainable housing development plan, and then let, let developers go at it within those, within those limits. So I think that's huge. Um, in terms of bang for your buck, if you're focused on the bottom end addressing poverty, there's a lot of evidence that the early years are crucial um, for a children, for child's development. You know, I don't always like this language, but spending money on the first three years gets you the biggest return in terms of improved health outcomes, just better lives in adulthood for those children. Um, so massive investment there is crucial. There's lots of really good evidence to back that up, all the work of James, James Hickman and people like that. 
um, you know, and we don't invest hugely in kids' early years compared even to Australia, let alone the Scandinavians, um, in terms of income support, in terms of support for parents, in terms of childcare, all those sorts of things. And I guess, I mean, I'm getting a bit away from one thing here, but if I get a third, that well, one thing at the top end, um, you know, would absolutely be some kind of proper tax on wealth that generates revenue. And why is that so crucial? Well, if you look at it from the if you don't like active government, um, what the reason that people who don't like active government are so hot on cutting taxes is it's a systemic change. You don't have to go around arguing for defunding the Ministry of Health, Ministry of Environment, Ministry of Transport. If you cut taxes, you've just defunded all of them in one go. So it's a really smart move, right? So conversely, increasing taxes is a systemic thing because if you had a proper tax on wealth, then you don't have to go around levying a tax to you know, address environmental degradation, to address housing. You've, raised, you've got a tax that does all those things at once. So I think that's a huge systemic change that we need. Yeah, well said. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, thanks to both of you. Um, Sean has a comment here about social capital. Mm -hmm. And I take it it's um, connected with your comments, Max, about sort of reframing the terminology of inequality around ensuring basic well being for everyone. Um, Sean, would you like to? Uh, make a comment or, or frame a question to Max about social capital. Uh, thanks, Jack. Um, yeah, enjoying the discussion. Um, I'm just saying that um, there's a link on Facebook. I think they've got a website to um, this guy called Tristan Clayton, who's a social capital researcher, and he often does webinars on different topics. And there's one happening in the next couple of weeks. Um, he's done series over the lockdown. Um, so people can go look, look that up if they like. Um, I was also going to say, this while I'm talking to you, Max, uh, Ken likes that, that um, movie, the doco Spirit of 45, about post-war Britain. Um, my question was, do you think that the current New Zealand situation is a good template um, for, for that, or vice versa, that the Spirit of 45 is a good uh, template for a New Zealand situation and the need to mobilise people in terms of ecology and poverty and other issues that we've got. Thanks. Yeah, thank, thanks for the question. It's a really interesting one. I haven't, haven't exactly ever thought about it in those terms. Um, I guess, I mean, I think there's elements there you could draw on. Um, it is tricky though, because, you know, World War II, I mean, we've had some terrible, of course, events recently, the global financial crisis and, you know, and COVID, obviously. None of them have really approached the scale, I think, of the suffering and destruction experienced by the UK, for instance, um, you know, or, or other European nations during World War II. I mean, it was just, you know, that was six years of, of misery and sort of uniting against a common enemy. And I think that created a bond that's very hard to replicate. And of course, I mean, and you wouldn't want to engineer a world war just to, to do that, and, um, you know, if it need be said. Um, so I, I don't know that there's the same sense of shared suffering that provided the ground um, for that kind of, that amazing sort of egalitarian push. Um, but there's certainly elements of that you can draw on. And, you know, and I think the team of 5 million, you know, the Unite, like, you know, come together against COVID messaging had elements of that. And one of the things I'm disappointed with a bit in the current government is they didn't really take that on. You know, sort of the team of five million stuff has kind of faded a bit. You know, we're sort of banked that we're like, oh yeah, we, we did that. Um, and I mean, we haven't even examined enough the fact that it wasn't even quite true. I mean, because lots of people were suffering more than others and we'll be really all in it together. Um, but, you know, I feel like that kind of togetherness could have been the foundation for, you know, trying to get the sort of the permission from the electorate for a really active government in a way that, and actually the, you know, Labour has just has gone pretty cautious um, on that. But yeah, but I, I, I certainly think there's things you can learn from the past. And, and here, you know, uh, our post-war housing, you know, state housing boom, like I said, you know, they were building the equivalent of tens of thousands of houses a year of state houses, you know, and that's really something we could look to emulate. 
Good. Um, Thank you. Deirdre, you, you had a comment here about infrastructure and, and the commons. Would you like to oh, say something yeah. or ask a question about that? Oh, yeah, I'm, you're, you seem to be going, okay. I did, I did have another question. Um, but the, if you want me to ask that on that, um, I notice, Max, that you're more and more recognizing the commons. I mean, you're even talking about the built in infrastructure being the commons. Um, and land as the commons and um, the fisheries and the air and all that sort of stuff. Um, the whole principle of taxing according to whether you monopolize part of the commons seems to me a good one to, to, to look at, you know, because you're actually, it's the land value that increases at, with, with capital gains. Your capital gains are mostly all always really land values increasing and it particularly increases near, near infrastructure um, like schools and um, good transport and hospitals or whatever. You, um, so the, the, the gain that people make in wealth is actually the unearned capital gains that they get from monopolizing the commons. Would you agree with that now, Max? Hmm. Um, I think it's true up to a point, but I probably wouldn't agree with where that might lead you um, in sort of policy terms. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I, I guess that sort of thinking would naturally lead you towards uh, a land tax um, of some kind or another. Which and, and I do understand the reasons for it, and look, it'll be easier to administer. And there's something, yeah, quite profound about saying, well, you didn't create this land, and there's a limited supply of it, and it is fundamentally our common inheritance. I guess the problem is that just from a very pragmatic point of view, um, I mean, you know, property is only is only a proportion of modern wealth, it's much less important than it was, you know, in, in past times. And the value of land within property is a even smaller subset of that. Um, so if you started out no. just by taxing land, yeah. then, you know, you, you, you're starting with a much smaller tax base and therefore your ability to generate revenue is much smaller than if you tax all wealth. And also why, you know, why should the tax system discriminate against people who've decided to hold their wealth as land, as opposed to people who decided to hold it as shares and bonds and things. Also, land is one of the most equally held, it's, you know, property is the most equally held major asset class in New Zealand, probably in any country. Um, yes, it's very unequal because of course, a lot of people don't own homes anymore, but it's still much more equal than all the other major types of wealth. So, you know, like if you look at if you, if you look at shares and bonds, well, it's just a matter of it's just a matter of fact. Okay. Um, yeah. If you look at the distribution of housing wealth, it's sort of pretty minimal on the bottom half of the population, and then it rises, you know, on a sort of forty-five degree angle. Whereas if you look at the distribution of share ownership in New Zealand, it is flat, and then it's a huge skyscraper um, for the wealthiest New Zealanders. So if you decided to tax land, you'd be deciding to tax the thing that is most equally held and not tax the thing that is most unequally held. So from an equity point of view, it really, it isn't at all where I'd be going. I'd be going down the lines of a wealth tax myself. Yeah, well, pe people have got shares in, um, in property um, companies and M McDonald's owns huge important inner city land and in every city of the world. I mean, it's the inner city land that's the big, the big issue. And the inner city, you know, minerals. I mean, the, the minerals that, that are owned by corporates and so on. Anyway, that's, that's a whole big issue, yeah. But there has been a, t a big study on, on what could be the income raised from uh, resource taxes in Australia about 10 years ago. And the land tax was the most, was the largest proportion, especially the urban land tax, 
Well, sure, but you can't get away from the fact that if you, you're taxing land, you're taxing a much smaller proportion of the asset base than if you tax all wealth. And so you, you just won't be able to achieve the same levels of revenue unless you levy the tax at a much higher rate than you would levy a wealth tax. Yeah. But at that point, why not just levy a higher wealth tax? And you'd probably be getting into having to tax land at rates that would just be unsustainable, certainly politically, so they if you're going to try to do that. Five and a half percent of of the land value in in the in the you know if you tax five and a half percent of the land value every year you'd you'd be wiping out people's property holdings pretty quickly if, no, particularly if they weren't economic so but, but look I, I don't, I don't like, think we, mind, we, we probably can't go into huge uh, discussion but Someone yeah I'm, I'm not convinced. <laughs> okay thank hey, you um I, I noticed that Miriamma Prickett had a, a similar question about the land tax. Was there any uh, other aspect of this, uh, Miriamma, that you would like to address or ask Max about that hasn't been covered so far in, in the exchange? Are you still here? No, maybe. maybe your microphone's off, but I think uh, Max has covered it pretty thoroughly. <laughs> okay, thank you. Just going to make sure you had a chance to question scrolling through the questions here um, uh, Donald quick had a comment about who was benefiting during the period of equalization would you like to address that uh, Don and uh, yeah I mean <laughs> My question uh, that I put out there sort of rushed. I'm not very good at doing that. You noted the 50s, 70s as being a period of equalization, but I wonder whether this was principally for Westerners or at least those prepared to adopt Western ways. Uh, and I'm given an example in New Zealand, it was a time of huge cultural loss for Maori, Maori already dispossessed possessed of the land and they just moved. Uh, Holus Bolus into, into the cities and lost even more of their culture. Uh, I guess, you know, you could look at the same thing happening in the UK when a lot of people from the Commonwealth came in uh, and, you know, uh, uh, Britain sort of benefited really on top of what was, I think, continuing colonial exploitation. It was the same in, uh, in, in Germany with Turks and various others coming and sure plenty of other countries as well. It seems to me that many of your arguments relate to a Western way of thinking economically. Um, and indeed, your discussion of the land was exactly that, as the land as, as a kind of commodity that we move around, whereas, in fact, uh, does the land actually belong to us, or do we belong to the land, rather? I mean, these are different kind of concepts, different conversations. And I think it, the, the conversations that we need to have it, in New Zealand, it's actually a, a very pertinent conversation, because, of course, uh, you know, our history in terms of the land wars, which are only just beginning to be discussed at, at school level. Um, so uh, I said many of your arguments relate to a Western way of thinking ep economically. Maybe we actually need a new way of thinking and we need to decolonize our way of thinking. Mm, yeah, I mean, of course, there's always that wider context, which I think I was um, discussing at various points in my talk. Um, yeah, I mean, well, was it principally for Westerners? Well, I mean, the the period between the 50s and the 80s, yeah, you always have to caveat it. And I'm always very resistant to people sort of talking about it as a golden era. I once wrote a piece about it that The Guardian put a headline on how inequality destroyed New Zealand's egalitarian paradise. And I got people saying, well, who was it a paradise for? You know, was it paradise for Pacifica who were being dawn raided, et cetera, et cetera, um, which is a very fair point. Um, and of course, wasn't my headline. Um, so yeah, I mean, there's limitations, you know, I mean, a lot of the equality benefited people from my demographic. Um, but e economically speaking, well, I mean, like I showed in the slides, that period was one in which incomes for Māori and women were catching up to those people of my demographic. Um, so it certainly wasn't exclusively um, just for Westerners, um, quote unquote. Uh, that period was also one in which actually decolonization 
was starting to happen, you know, in which many of the colonial empires were surrendering, uh, you, know, you know, the possessions that they had mm-hmm. legitimately acquired. Um, and yeah, I mean, in terms of sort of the treatment of land and stuff, well, yeah, I mean, I am talking about it as an economic asset because, you know, there's a discussion about economic inequality. Um, you can, of course, have a, a much wider discussion about things. And um, I think, well, like, and like I said at the outset, you know, I'm in favor of, for instance, you know, significant devolution to Māori. In fact, I think, you know, if Māori want their own institutions, you know, going all the way up to the parliamentary level to run their own affairs, then that should happen. Um, you know, I certainly don't think that they should have to live according to Western concepts and values. Um, but, you know, in terms of my own life, I mean, I think, I think it'd be very damaging and incorrect to say that there is a Western way of doing things. And, you know, I think there's incredible things in the, in the sort of the Western concept set. I mean, they should never have been imposed on other cultures by force. Um, but, you know, there's, lot, there's lots of really valuable traditions. And I think we just keep working and ameliorating and perfecting those traditions that we work in. Can I maybe have a little comeback on that? Uh, uh, and that is, uh, I think you commented that, yes, it went up for Māori because what I said was, I mean, I agree with you absolutely about Western is, 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 a, is, a, is a bit of a bag that but I'm not trying to condemn everything there. Uh, but uh, there's certainly very major approaches from a Western side, you know, going back to Descartes and how we mm, sort of separated mind from matter and all this kind of stuff. But uh, I, I guess um, the, what I said was that people, uh, the Westerners or people who accepted Western ways, now I think Māori got better only because they, you know, they more or less were forced by circumstances to urbanize. Uh, it wasn't necessarily uh, a, a choice, a cultural choice. It was, it, it was an economic, forced economic choice. I also think that probably a lot of the, uh, um, uh, um, you talked about countries being, um, you know, uh, decolonized. A lot of that was because they had already been exploited. They weren't getting many more. They weren't getting much more out of them. Uh, and the second place uh, they quite reasonably saw coming what exactly has happened in, in, in the, the last sort of 30 years is the rest of the world is now demanding its, its, its bit. <laughs> we took a lot from them and now they want it back or they want something in return. Uh, and, and so decolonization is, uh, in terms of just giving people's independence, usually without, with bugger all, excuse the language, bugger all support to do so, is really, was a cop out as much as anything else. And I don't think that's decolonizing. Uh, decolonizing is something ha- what we need to do in our own heads. Hmm. Yeah, no, I, I, and on that point, certainly I'd agree with you. Yep, yeah, it's a state of mind. Um, and we've got a long way to go, I think, you know, in this country and elsewhere. Thank you, Don. Um, Audrey has a question here about the, I guess, the, the general issue is the universal universality of uh, benefits. Audrey, would you like to uh, put your question to Max? And yes. yes, the question is... Uh, what if people who get the pension were encouraged to voluntarily give that money back to the government and they would be able to say uh, in which particular area that money could go? They might choose health or education, for example. Mm, um, yeah, I mean, that's similar to the Spend My Super um, campaign, which... Look, I mean, I, I, I support that, you know, um, if, if you don't feel like you need the, the pension yourself. But I wouldn't, I mean, I wouldn't want to place a great store on that. I mean, for a start, you know, if you really sort of took up that line of thinking, it, I'm sure this isn't where you want to go, but it could lead people down the path of thinking, oh, well, you know, the universality of super is a bad idea. And, you know, and we should start, you know, means testing it um, or whatever. I also don't, I'm not a huge fan of the idea of sort of people being able to direct where their sort of tax contributions go. 
and again, you may not have sort of envisaged this sort of wider argument, but if you sort of, if you could direct where your sort of returned superannuation payments went, then philosophically, why couldn't you direct where your tax contributions went? And then we'd sort of have quite a difficult world where, you know, government would sort of be very constrained in what it did because you'd sort of have all these different bits of money allocated by people to different places, which wouldn't be actually what the government needed to do to govern coherently. And you'd also have a bit more, I think, of a, a bit more of a user pays sort of approach to government at that point. So, well, I pay my tax money for things that I want or things that I want to see versus, you know, tax is, a, is an investment in our collective endeavor. You know, as Oliver Wendell Holmes said, it's the price we pay for civilization. Um, and it's, it's what we pay for things that none of us could do individually. So look, I'm not against that idea in really simple terms, but I'd be a bit nervous about where it might lead if it sort of got taken up um, at scale. Yeah, isn't it also the case that uh, there are many charities to which one can contribute uh, that, that could help with the inequality issue if people have, have the means and the desire? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. It's, it's Although, not an institutional uh, solution, but, but it is a, an, an option. Yeah, although I, I do think the intent behind the question is a good one in the sense that I do think resolving inequality is, is fundamentally a government issue. I mean, you know, all the causes I outlined stem from politics, basically. And look, and I'm certainly, you know, I'm supportive of, of Kids Can and the other charity, which might be charities that you could donate your money to. But I do think the solution, you know, has to come from government. And look, I mean, and if everyone had got a decent income through work or, you know, or through the benefit system, you know, and we recognised all the unpaid contributions that people make, you know, would, would you have a need for charities at that point? Well, in, mo in many cases, probably not. Yeah. Max, a, a couple of questions about um, income. You talked about a guaranteed income as opposed to a, a uh, UBI, universal basic income. Mm. And I'm, I'm assuming it's because the latter would be um, economically unsustainable yes. and, and tar targeted uh, to a guaranteed income would be much more sensible and, and efficient. Yes. Is that the essential difference that you would see? Yeah, and the guaranteed minimum income, because it is withdrawn as people earn more um, in the conventional in the in the paid workforce, allows you to give much more generous support to those who need it most, which for me is the absolute, the single most important thing that a welfare system can do. You know, I, I understand the arguments for universality and that certainly would have some benefits, but it seems to me it falls down profoundly because you'd be spending a colossal amount of money on a universal basic income, you know, $30 billion even, at a, you know, even if you set it at the current rate of, of the unemployment benefit, and you'd be spending all that money without necessarily boosting the incomes of the most vulnerable. And I, I just find it very hard to understand how that is even a vaguely sensible use of money and I would, for, for a t fraction of that cost, you could massively boost the incomes of people who are completely reliant on benefits and massively enhance their dignity and ability to participate. And to me, that just seems like the priority. Yeah. yeah. Would, would you um, make the same comments with respect to the notion of um, universal basic services? Because that gets more to the, you know, the well-being issue that uh... yeah yeah I, I I'm probably instinctively more supportive of universal basic services I haven't exactly seen that fleshed out you know what it would look like how it would work um, you know because things that are very basic like food you know, the, they, they work best delivered by the private sector. And the point there is to ensure that people have enough income to buy food in private supermarkets. Um, but I do think, you know, there's a huge role to expand, need to expand public services. Because again, because, you know, you, you, people need more income, that's crucial. But there are things that people can't buy with income, or which wouldn't work very well if we tried to deliver them through people buying them with income, like, you know, privatizing the health and education systems would be a disaster. So those are the things that we need, to, we need to address, yeah, through much better services. And by making those services free, it's a bit like giving people an income boost who rely on them, um, but you're delivering them much more efficiently through government, collectively through taxes than you could through people purchasing them. 
um, yeah, so I, 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 I haven't quite always got my head around universal basic services, if I'm honest, but I'm instinctively more attracted to it, yeah. Thank you. The, the other side of the um, guaranteed income is the issue of maximum income, um, which, which rarely seems to get discussed. There's a little bit of discussion about the range of uh, pay between the uppermost senior person in an organization and the, and the lowest paid. Do you ever see governments regulating that kind of range? I mean, they do it within the public service, but uh, it's not, there's no regulation that I'm aware of in the uh, private sector. No, and I mean, to be honest, there's not even that much regulation in the public sector. I mean, the Public Service Commission does you know, influence pay, but we have totally out of control pay rates for government sector chief executives, I think, um, because we've bought into the idea that they should operate, government departments should operate like corporations. And so you need these hugely paid CEOs when there's no evidence that that actually improves performance. So I would, I would like to see pay ratios made mandatory in the public sector, you know, so that you're chief executive can't earn more than, you know, eight or 10 times what the lowest paid staff member is on in, in their um, government agency. I would then like to see that turned into at least quite a strong nudge for the private sector. I don't think you could ever mandate it politically uh, across the whole private sector, but you could say, if you want to get government departments, uh, government contracts, and government contracts are really important for a lot of businesses, uh, you can't have a pay ratio of more than 10 to one say, you know, and that would change behavior pretty quickly. Um, just just on the, also on the guaranteed minimum income, I was just looking through the questions and I did spot a question about unpaid labor and caring and volunteering that I really wanted to pick up if I can, of course, thought it's important. Please. And just really briefly to say that for me, that's one of the great benefits of a guaranteed minimum income. You know, the only test is, are you earning income from paid work? If so, you know, we start to claw the guaranteed minimum income back from you. And so because there are none of those tests, then you can get the guaranteed minimum income for doing things like caring and volunteering. So it explicitly recognizes those contributions predominantly done by women um, in ways that our current benefit system really doesn't do at all or does extremely badly. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, I'd like to ask one final question. I'm, I'm guessing that the all, if not all, all of the folks who tuned in this evening to this topic um, have done so because they're concerned about the issue of inequality. What would your suggestions be to what we can do as citizens? What, what's the most effective thing we can do um, to contribute to a more equal and just society? Yeah, it's a, it's a really great question. And I mean, you, I don't, you know, if, if I suspect a lot of people in this group are, are already really active in lots of other areas. And, you know, you don't, you don't want to overtax yourself, um, as it were. But what can people do? Well, I mean, just having conversations about these issues with people who aren't, you know, if, you, if you've got people in your ambit, you know, conservative relatives, neighbors, workmates, people outside of, you know, our own bubble, just having good conversations with them, you know, non-spiky sort of non-judgmental ones that are just trying to open people up, you know, understand where they're coming from, explain to them why you think tackling inequality is important and the fact that it's about, you know, enhancing everyone's opportunities for well-being and fulfilling lives. You know, that, that sounds simple, but that's really important. Keeping on, you know, one of the persons who asked a question earlier, writing letters to the editor, those things get noticed, you know, MPs read letters to the editor. They also pay attention to handwritten letters that they get um, because, you know, they get so much email now, you know, a handwritten letter is actually sort of meaningful. There's all those things you can do. More specifically, you know, it's really hard to do anything much as an individual. So my adv uh, advice is always, find an organization that you can join that's already there, that's doing work on the ground. Um, the living wage campaign is great and it's achieving real wins. It's signing up more organizations every day that are saying, yeah, we'll pay the living wage. 
So, you know, join that movement if you can. If you're in an organization where you can lobby for them to pay, think about paying the living wage, do that. Or join one of the active groups like the Child Poverty Action Group that's putting the pressure on. I mean, there aren't really any groups out there that focus on the top end. We've never sort of been able to get a high pay commission or anything like that off the ground. But there's lots of groups that are at least trying to lift things up at the bottom and draw attention to the problems of poverty. And I'd, I'd seek out the local one in your area and get involved in that way. Yeah, good response, thank you. Max, on behalf of everyone present and for the many people in the country that you've uh, influenced in your writing, uh, thank you very, very much for the presentation and discussion this evening and, and taking the time out of your, I'm sure, busy schedule. Uh, and I would encourage everyone to, uh, if you're not familiar with Max's writing, it's very clear, very well organized, very well referenced, very well researched, and, and very worth the read. Um, he's got a terrific blog, as well as the excellent books that he's written. So um, uh, th there's a great resource there. And again, thanks very, very much, Max. Um, just as a last word, our uh, next webinar will be uh, presented by Nikki Harry, psychologist from Auckland. And um, the topic isn't quite clear yet, but I'm hoping that she'll address the issue of some of the psychological challenges that we face on a social scale in terms of making the kinds of changes we need for both a socially just and ecologically sustainable society. And I believe that will be on the 11th of August. Uh, so keep a, a lookout for the uh, invitation or the notice that um, OCD members will receive. And you can go to the Art Climate Declaration website to uh, check on that if you wish. Um, Tonight's uh, session has been recorded and it will be put up on the uh, on YouTube for uh, reviewing. So if there's some points that you missed and you want to re revisit them, uh, you'll be able to do that as well as to tell others about uh, its availability. So that notice uh, you can check on the uh, our climate declaration website again for the uh, YouTube link. It'll probably take a day or two to get up there but it uh, should be there soon. So again, thank you all for participating and uh, especially to Max for taking the time to speak with us this evening. Thanks very much, it's been a pleasure. Thanks everyone. Thank you very much. I'm running over to thank Unity you. Books to buy your book tomorrow. <laughs> ah, excellent. <laughs> yeah, and sorry to those if you, you didn't get a chance to uh, ask your question, maybe next time. Night-night.